Dr. Lefkowitz is the James B. Duke Professor of Medicine and Professor of Biochemistry and Chemistry at Duke University Medical Center. He has been an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute since 1976. Originally trained as a physician, he began his research career in the late 60s and is internationally recognized for his groundbreaking discoveries that reveal the inner workings of an important family of G-protein coupled re receptors for which he was awarded the 2012 Nobel Prize for Chemistry along with Brian Kabilka, who was also his mentee. Mentoring young scientists has been a passion of Dr. Lefkowitz throughout his career and continues today. His former trainees describe him as devoted to them as well as their scientific career success. He has trained generations of scientists, many of whom have achieved success nationally and internationally. Dr. Lefkowitz has received numerous awards and honors, including the National Medal of Science, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. As a friend and colleague, he is also one of the most humble people I know. He continues to make tremendous scientific discoveries while always making time for his colleagues, his trainees, and his family. And I know personally how much his colleagues appreciate his mentoring, since one of them happens to be my wife, Mary Klotman, who serves as the dean of the Duke University School of Medicine. So upon the recommendation of the faculty and by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Baylor College of Medicine, I confer upon Robert J. Lefkowitz the honorary degree of Doctor of Letters in Medicine and admit you to all its rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Thank you very much, Bob. I'd like to have one final round of applause for all of our awardees today. Thank you. Bob, the podium is here. Mr. Loomis, members of the board, Dr. Klotman, <clears throat> distinguished faculty, distinguished guests and honorary degree recipients, graduates, family, and friends. I would like to offer my heartfelt congratulations to all those who will be receiving their MD or PhD degree shortly. I'm honored to have been invited to address you this evening. But please understand that I have absolutely no illusions about my role. Not too long ago I read that 10 years after graduation, virtually no one remembers who spoke at their commencement. <laughs> I know that I certainly don't. So at this point, I assume that you are reasonably wondering why I'm up here and whether I've got anything worthwhile to say to you. Let me hasten to assure you, I'm wondering about these things too. <laughs> As to why I'm up here, I imagine it may be because I won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. What I have learned in my five years or so as a Nobel laureate is that this award apparently entitles me to pontificate on virtually any subject at any time, regardless of whether I know anything about it. Moreover, I have learned that most people will take what I have to say much more seriously than is justified by the content of my remarks. <laughs> With that caveat, I have indeed been racking my brain trying to tease out at least a few pearls of wisdom to bestow upon you. Presumably, there should be some elements discernible in my career that might serve as guideposts for you, things worth emulating or that I might have learned along the way that are worth imparting to you. What? I have repeatedly asked myself, have I learned in the more than 50 years since I sat, much as you do today, at my own medical school graduation from Columbia in 1966 that might be worth talking to you about? I realized, of course, that such life lessons are not something one ordinarily thinks much about. One is just too busy living them. I'm reminded of something that my favorite philosopher, 
the former New York Yankees catcher Yogi Berra once said. When he was asked what he thought about when he was trying to get a hit in a clutch situation, think he replied, how the heck are you going to think and hit at the same time? <clears throat> so I have been thinking about it lately. And what I decided I want to talk to you about today is something I don't hear much about these days, the importance and power of experiencing your life's work as a calling. Now, the dictionary defines a calling as, quote, a strong impulse or inclination, a summons to some particular mission, usually one of some social value. But let me amplify on that in terms of my own experience. I've been remarkably fortunate to have felt a calling to two careers in medicine, first as a physician and later as a scientist. The notion of a calling is often intertwined with important role models. Almost all successful individuals can readily identify several crucial figures that they encountered early in life or early in their careers who modeled a way of doing things that had immediate and compelling appeal. As a youngster growing up in the Bronx, New York City, I had at least four heroes or role models. The Yankee slugger, Mickey Mantle. The humorist, Woody Allen. The author of the James Bond novels, Ian Fleming. And my family physician, who actually made house calls. In the end, it was the latter role model that ultimately captured my attention and my fancy. From about the third grade on, I never had any doubt that I was destined to be a physician just like him. I loved reading books about doctors, especially novels in which an MD, MD played a central, usually heroic role. Throughout high school and college, I actively looked forward to entering medical school. To me, becoming a member of the medical profession was something very special perhaps somewhat akin to entering the clergy, in that one was privy to very special knowledge and also bore unique responsibilities. I thoroughly enjoyed my four years in medical school as a house officer at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, as a cardiology fellow at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and as a young professor of medicine at Duke, where I attended cardiology clinic, and a, until about 10 years ago, still made general medical ward rounds. These were experiences that I will always treasure. They felt perfectly right for me, an expression of my most deeply felt aspirations and the most natural and productive outlet for my own particular abilities and talents. In other words, I experienced the practice of medicine as a calling. I assume that the overwhelming majority of you will spend your careers practicing medicine. The nature of this practice has changed very significantly in the greater than 50 years since I graduated medical school. In this regard, I do hope that the pressures imposed, for example, by the need for extensive documentation of electronic medical records and third-party reimbursements will not too seriously impact your instincts to practice in a compassionate, caring, patient, and devoted way. In my own case, my love, my love for clinical medicine began to evolve into something else. During the early years of my training, I had never really considered that I might become a scientist in addition to a physician. But a two-year experience at the National Institutes of Health in fulfillment of my draft obligation in the late 1960s during the Vietnam War began to change all that. After a very slow start, during which I displayed absolutely no talent whatsoever at the bench, I began to show some promise. But it would take another five to seven years before it would become clear to me that my primary mission, the real focus of my life's work, would actually lie in the laboratory rather than at the bedside. So how did I ultimately come to realize that perhaps my truest calling was in scientific research? These are not things one figures out with one's head, but rather with one's heart. For example, I realized that, more and more, my thoughts and daydreams at odd times, such as on the drive home from work, were on my experiments, rather than on patients that I had seen in the clinic. 
let me hasten to add that I am by no means implying that I believe there is any inherent inconsistency in a career which combines both medical research and practice. Only that for me, this apparently was not the way. That said, I can tell you that despite my singular focus on fundamental research for many decades now, a clinical and physiological perspective informs and guides my research to this very day. And I still maintain an active medical license. So why do I think the experience of a calling is so important? And how does one know if one is launched on one's true path? The first point is that I don't believe that for any individual, there is necessarily only one possible best choice. As I mentioned, in my own case, I have felt the calling to at least two careers. And I've known many colleagues who have continuously and successfully reinvented themselves in a variety of roles. Of course, one of the wonderful things about a career in medicine and the other health professions on which all of you now embark is that the journey has so many possible itineraries and so many possible destinations. I would hope that none of you will ever feel hemmed in or confined by choices you have made early on. Sometimes these can last a lifetime, but sometimes another aspect of yourselves may play a more prominent role later on. So try to be open to such evolution. So how do you know if you're responding to a true calling, one that is really right for you? I think that there are various diagnostic tests that you may use. Do you feel a passionate engagement in what you are doing? Does it intensely focus your concentration? Do you experience a sense of timelessness when engaged in your work such that the hours just seem to fly by? Do you often have the sense that your work is not really work at all, but rather just what you were meant to do? Hopefully, in the years ahead, you will be able to answer an emphatic yes to these questions. I think that there are several important elements in this notion of a calling. The first is the simple power of belief in what you are doing and in its importance. This will empower you to achieve, perhaps, more than you ever had imagined possible. The second is the conviction that you were really meant to do this and that the work fully engages the best of your own innate talent and abilities. In this context, President John F. Kennedy, in a, praise of Aris, in a paraphrase of Aristotle, said, the ancient Greek definition of happiness is the full use of your powers along lines of excellence. Think about that for a minute. The full use of your powers along lines of excellence. This same ideal is found in the Hippocratic Oath, which you will shortly uh, repeat. It says, that into whosoever's home I shall enter, it shall be for the good of the sick and the well to the utmost of my power. A corollary of this is that you are truly following your own path, listening to the stirrings of your own heart and not doing something that you feel someone else wants you to do. And the third, which flows naturally from the other two, is a sense of enthusiasm for and optimism about what you do. These latter elements are quite infectious. If you follow an academic path, as I have, they will assure that you will be an attractive role model for younger colleagues that come to learn from you. If you're a full-time clinician, they will certainly be much appreciated by your patients. If you're able to tap into this notion of a calling, you will be fortunate indeed, for it holds the key to a career characterized by fulfillment, contentment, and a sense of accomplishment. The simple secret is you just have to believe in it. But of course, there is more to life than work, as you all know. Maintaining a sense of balance between a busy and committed medical career on the one hand and family life on the other can provide a real challenge. But such a balance is crucial if you are to lead a full life. My fondest wish for all of you is that in the years ahead, 
you will feel as I have throughout my career, that two of your favorite times of the day are when you leave for work in the morning, anticipating the adventures and challenges that lie ahead, and when you return home in the evening, anticipating your time with your family and leisure pursuits. Now, as I conclude these remarks, I hope that you will not judge them too harshly, but rather will measure them against the yardstick provided by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who is reputed to have said that there are only three important rules for public speaking. Be sincere, be brief, and be seated. <laughs> My heartiest congratulations to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.